membership. I also spent a large part of my childhood growing up in Florida and being amongst the alligators and the frogs <laughs> and growing up in the swamp and just really connecting to nature and connecting to um, environmental lands that my Choctaw um, ancestors have connected with. Um, unfortunately, due to assimilation, due to slavery um, by the conquistadors, on the southeast of the U.S., I also have Dene or Navajo lineage, and because of assimilation due to slavery, um, it has been really challenging to tackle um, the issue of reconnecting with my roots. Um, being African American, I have always had a strong connection with my beautiful black grandmothers who grew up in Arkansas and Mississippi. They were alive during the times of the civil um, rights movement. My grandmother is a survivor of the Mississippi burnings during the 60s when the KKK would roll into town and terrorize the citizens. Um, my grandmother, Wendy, is Afro Choctaw, and she was living in Arkansas around the time of the Civil Rights Movement, and she has a lot of stories of her surviving intense racism and discrimination during the Civil Rights Movement as well. My grandmother, Aline Price, was actually a child during the 60s, and she can tell me stories about her um, picking cotton as a little girl for white plantation owners. Despite this not being the time of slavery, there was a big community of black folk that didn't know that slavery ever ended. And these plantations actually kept running up until the late 70s and early 80s. Now, in the process of reconnecting with my Native American roots and always being in the culture of being an African-American queer individual. I strive to be the best person I can be for both sides of my culture. And being a Satanic Temple member, I always strive to follow the seven tenets. And I'm gonna talk about how I implement that into my everyday life. So let's go over that. So tenant one should be that one should strive to act with compassion and empathy towards all creature in accordance with reason. Tenet two is the struggle for justice is an ongoing and necessary pursuit that should prevail over laws and institutions. Tenet three is one's body is inviolable, subjects to one's own will alone. Tenet four is the freedoms of others should be respected, including the freedom to offend, to willfully and unjustly encroach upon the freedoms of another is to forego one own, one's own. Tenet five is beliefs should conform to one's best scientific understanding of the world. One should take care to never distort scientific facts to fit one's belief. Tenet six is people are fallible. If one makes a mistake, one should do one's best to rectify it and resolve any harm that might have been caused. Tenet seven, every tenet is a guiding principle designed to inspire nobility in action and thought. The spirit of compassion, wisdom, and justice should always prevail over written or spoken word and with these seven tenets today, we're going to continue on with our presentation and what the seven tenets mean to me. Okay. So this is my mission statement for Coyote's Cauldron. As we see here, it says Coyote Cauldron supports Sudan, Palestine, Congo, Force, First Nations, African American Liberation, Reproductive Autonomy, and the LGBT community. We are all, we are not free until we are all free. 
Now, that we get into the meat of this conversation, the reason why African American and Indigenous storytelling and folklore is so important is because it teaches us lessons in history. It teaches us to remember our roots. These stories passed down teach us to live off the land. It is also important to remember that when we are talking about African American and Native American traditions and culture, that everyone in both sides of the diaspora are not a monolith culture, but we are all diverse and rich with our own individual cultures. And that is what makes us so great as a community of African Americans and Native Americans. Okay, so now we're going to talk about art. <laughs> so this picture is a picture of a Choctaw deity called Umta. He, this could also be interpreted with the West African spider god Anasi. All right, so we see here that this is the hierophant the hierophant card. And when I created this, I wanted to create a story of spiritual evolution and elevation. I wanted to tell a story of what it means to seek higher knowledge and what does that look like for us. And I wanted to represent that higher knowledge is something so beautiful and with the right groundwork put in place that you can really achieve whatever you want to do when it comes to higher education and spiritual elevation. When it comes to um, Anasi, the West African spider god, he is a trickster spirit. It could also be said that Anta, the Choctaw spider god, is also a trickster spirit. But when it comes to trickster spirits, we can find a lot of knowledge in the stories that have been weaved, <laughs> spun, right? So, sorry. <laughs> it looks good. So, Ankta is a Choctaw spider god of knowledge and wisdom. Okay, it is said in, in Choctaw folklore that he crawled from the earth and flew amongst the stars, and he brought down the flames from the sun, and he brought it down to the people of the southwest. All right. So this is one of my favorite pieces. I love the celestial aspect of it. Whenever I visualize Amta in my day-to-day -day spiritual work, I just imagine this beautiful celestial spider god just weaving planets together and bringing us together as a community. All right. The Hierophant card, when it comes to the tarot deck, means that it is an established set of spiritual values is a priest that it interprets esoteric principles or secret hidden knowledge. All right, this is um, Escalé, the Choctaw birth goddess. Okay, when it comes down south, we do have stories of the creation of the Choctaw and how Choctaw people come from the earth womb, which is located underneath the Earth's crust. Now, in the Earth room, the goddess that um, regulate this realm would be Eleske, our beautiful grasshopper goddess. She is the goddess of pre-birth, where spirits are waiting to be born underneath the Earth's crust. She is a reminder that life is sacred and divine. She is a reminder that it is important for us to be connected with the earth and it inspires and she inspires me every day that it's important to be a good steward of nature and the environment around us because we are all one with the earth, okay? We all come from it, we die in it, we live in it. The earth is our home and is important to respect it and it's important to respect Escalade, <laughs> the one who gives us life, right? All right, this is probably one of my most favorite pieces. This is a image of Cinti Lapita, 
Choctaw Horn Serpent Deity. Now, this is a piece that is inspired by an ancestral ancient ceremonial plate found in Alabama in Chickasaw Ch Choctaw Territory. All right, there now I will say when it comes to horned serpents, stories of the horned serpent does kind of stretch across the nation when it comes to indigenous folklore and, and storytelling. All right, I wouldn't say it's monolith, but it's almost monolith with how many different cultures have a story about Centilipeda. He's also known as Senti Hollow for the Chickasaw. And when it comes to the Cherokee, he is known as Uptena, okay? Horned serpent that resides in the swamps. It is said that he's kind of more of a malevolent spirit that resides down in these swamps and marshes. And that if you make eye contact with him and his very glowy gem in between his eyes, that he will um, compel you to drown yourself. However, that is just exclusive to the Cherokee. But when it comes to Choctaw and our story of Sentilapita, it is said that he is one that disperses spiritual gifts of knowledge. So when I think of this, I think of something that represents equality and the fact that it is in a circle. We have the Hamsa symbolism over here that represents good fortune. In the middle of Sentilapita, the horn serpents. And I believe that when we channel our divine snake energy, we channel something bigger than us, something that's ancient, something that has been here long before any of us were even a thought. And that is the spirit of Sintilapita that roams the south of the United States. Okay. Hmm? All right, so this is where we're going to get into a little bit more of a deeper conversation. We're going to be talking about the story of the Native American communities here in Salem as well as the story of, of slavery that took place here in Salem long ago that I don't feel like gets talked enough. All right, so. <laughs> I know, right? right? You're pretty sad, <laughs> Like, yes. Um, so the backbone of the, the budding economy of Salem when it comes to the 16th, the 18th, to the um, 18th century was actually slavery, as slavery was a merchant town in its conceptualization, okay? Now, Salem built its economy off of the slave trade and off of the spices that were being produced by slaves in the West Indies and other um, territories. So when we think about slavery, we think about, oh, it just happened so long ago, and it's just something that we can easily just like not actively think about. But I want you guys to put into perspective that from the 16th to the 18th century, 12.5 million, yes, million African individuals were kidnapped from Africa and brought over to the U.S., now, out of that 12.5 million, only 10.7 million of them made it to the U.S. So what does that mean? That means that millions of individuals died on the ships from Africa to the U.S. And they would do this by jumping ship because they would rather drown than be forced into a life of servitude, which they would never be able to escape. And there's also a lot of human rights with, uh, violations that took place as well. And this is really important to remember when we think about how Salem was built. We think that it just was built off of the backbone of settlers, but that is not the case. They did have the servitude of millions of slaves coming in and out of the ports here in town to build the economy and build the infrastructure that makes Salem today. 
So Salem does have a lot of ugly history, and I think it is important for us to remember that these were millions of people who were displaced and kidnapped from Africa and brought to the United States. These are millions of children who were brought to the United States from Africa to perform slave labor. And it's something that we always need to keep in the back of our mind whenever we are walking around town, that this is sacred because this is the home of the unmarked, the unmarked graves of millions of slaves that came here to build this country. And I'm gonna circle back to the story of my grandmother, Aline Price, and how she would tell me that she was a child picking cotton in Mississippi. We think that the idea of plantations was something that ended in the 18th century after slavery, but that is not the case. A lot of plantations down south actually kept their slaves educationally hostage. They didn't educate their slaves in telling them that they were free to go. So a lot of black people stayed in these plantations to continue doing work, not knowing that they were actually free. And these practices actually continued on into the late 70s, early 80s. And I recount hearing stories of my grandma picking cotton as a little girl. And frankly, it just breaks my heart. She had no idea what she was participating in and how could she. Um, my grandma would tell me horrible things um, of surviving the civil rights movement in Mississippi. And um, how she would see friends from school hanging from trees. She would see KKK members strolling around town terrorizing everyone and she didn't know what was to become of her as a little girl i can't imagine how terrifying that would be knowing that that's your reality and knowing that as a child you're so helpless i'm doing this presentation in honor of all the black kids during the civil rights movement that were scared and didn't know what was becoming of their community and what was becoming of their country. And this is important to remember that we have living, breathing black people today who are here to carry these stories. And that's why it's important to preserve African American storytelling and folklore and culture because without African Americans, this country would not be what it is today. <sighs> it's important to remember that if it wasn't for all the slaves doing their work on plantations that we wouldn't have the spices and flavors that we have today. We wouldn't have the beautiful mix of culture that we have today in the United States. It's important to remember that, you know, children never deserve to go through what they went through when it comes to slavery in Salem and down South. It's actually unspoken about, but slave traders during the 18th century in Salem actually didn't stop participating in the slave trade even after the Civil War. Okay, they would still go out of their way and network down south and transport slaves. Okay. Next. Now we're gonna to be touching on the Salem history when it comes to the Massachusetts tribe and more specifically the Massachusetts band of tribal members called the Nam Keg. Now before Roger Conant descended here in 1626, this was originally Nam Keg land. Thousands of Namkeg individuals here built a community for themselves and they learned to live off the land and be kind to one another. 
it's really important to remember that the Nam Keg were kind and hospitable people. And if it wasn't for the Nam Keg's kindness to the settlers in the 16th century, that the settlers would have perished or been forced to move back home to Europe. But because of the Nam Keg's kindness, they educated the settlers on how to live off the land how to build houses on this land, and they participated in generous trade between each other. So this is a picture of the Nam Kegs in their kindness and hospitality being extended to the settlers as you see here. Now there Unfortunately, was a lot of issues with the settlers coming into Salem in the 16th century. Um, a large, um, a large number of Namkeg individuals actually ended up perishing because of diseases like smallpox and war. This decimated their numbers by nearly 90 percent. From 1675 to 1676, there was an event called the Great Philip, Great Phillips War, where this was a time of political and military tension between several different indigenous communities and the settlers. It was said that um, the English settlers actually recruited different um, indigenous tribal members to aid in their fight against other indigenous tribal members. So it was an all out war in the Great Philip War from 1675 to 1676. And this was the final nail in the coffin for the Nam Keg community. Now, because of the tra tragedies of disease and war, Several different Massachusetts tribes um, are not individual anymore, but now we have a monolith community called the Massachusetts Tribe. And a big 20% of my uh, revenue from purchases made here does go to the Massachusetts Tribe itself. I do believe that if we want to make Salem great again, that we need to have the Massachusetts tribal members come here and reclaim the land that was once theirs. And settlers do not have to worry about this being taken in war and anger. The Nam Keg were never people of anger and war. They wanted to help, and that's what they did until the very end. It's important to remember that. Now, when it comes to Salem and Massachusetts in terms of indigenous communities, there is 12,855 enrolled indigenous tribal members in Massachusetts today. Because of the Great Phillips War, the entire indigenous community of Massachusetts um, was decimated by 80%. Think about thousands of people just gone. And this is what made ways for settlers to build Salem into what it is today. Now, when it comes to Salem, Massachusetts, and those who identify as Native American, that population is less than 1%. And that's something to really think about and ponder about when we recognize and understand that this is Nam Keg in Massachusetts land. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Religious Crime Code of 1883. This is something that has affected my family lineage personally. My mother is of Spanish, Jewish, and Navajo descent. And growing up, I always knew that I had some sort of brown on my family, but we were never able to pinpoint where that brown came from. And the reason for this is because of assimilation 
from the conquistadors of the south southwest all right my navajo lineage was a slave generations ago and i did not grow within Navajo culture, and really that is a shame because the, the Diné have a beautiful culture that is still celebrated to this day. I am someone who is a Diné practitioner myself as I have reconnected with those roots and I've brought back Diné medicine into my family practice. Now, when we think of the Religious Crimes Codes of 1883, this was an act put in place by the U.S. government that prohibited any type of indigenous culture or dances or medicine. And this was a complete full stop force of assimilation from settlers to various different indigenous communities across the United States. We're going to talk a little bit about how the Religious Crimes Code pushed 40,000 indigenous children into boarding schools. Over 40,000 indigenous children into boarding schools where they were forced to cut their hair and they were forced to assimilate to their captors' way of life. Now, up until recently, we had no idea where what happened to these indigenous children that ended up at these boarding schools until we found mounds of indigenous children surrounding these boarding school sites. It is estimated that 40,000 plus indigenous children of the America were slaughtered and then buried here at these sites without the knowledge of their family. I, I don't even have any words for that. It's so horrible to think about these Native American kids being ripped away from their families, forced into these boarding schools, and then never return. 40,000 kids that deserve to grow up and preserve their culture, and they weren't allowed to. My heart breaks every time I think about these numbers and it, my heart breaks thinking about how many kids were victims of displacement and genocide and how we as a people collectively have been so comfortable in these numbers. And really it's such a shame. <laughs> now, We're going to be talking about real life atrocities happening today. And this is a picture of some individuals from Sudan escaping war. All right, there has been high political and military tensions in two particular African countries Democratic Republic of Congo and Sudan. There has been a silent genocide and a silent um, humanitarian crisis going on there over in Africa. Since 1995 or 98, it is estimated that 6 million people in the Democratic Republic of Congo have died due to the political tensions going on over there in their country. As of right now, there is millions of people in Sudan and in Congo who are going without food and water. This is a beautiful culture that we have over in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Sudan that I don't feel gets nearly enough appreciation. So many African Americans can trace their lineage back to these very countries. And when we think about how big 10 million people is as a number, there's only a handful of us in this very room. And this is a full room. Now multiply, multiply that by nearly a thousand, right? And you got 10 million people who are facing displacement, facing a silent genocide. And not a lot of countries 
are standing up for them right now. This is an issue that I don't feel like it's talked about nearly enough. It breaks my heart to hear stories of families being ravaged by um, rebel groups as they tear through these villages. So many families are going into hiding. So many families are going without food. So many families are going without water and shelter. And I can't help but feel helpless for these people that live across the sea from us. So that's why I decided to donate a portion of my proceeds to um, this very wonderful woman called the Life down in Sudan. She is a um, medical student. She is trained to be a doctor. And she's an English teacher for Sudanese students who want to learn English and expand their life skills. Now, she is someone who is under immediate threat of RSF forces causing bodily harm to her and her family. So it is important that we act now because while we have time to talk about these issues in these room, millions of people in Africa in places like Sudan and the Democratic Republic do not have time on their side. With every day that passes, thousands of people are fleeing Sudan and Congo without anyone to call on issues like this. And that's why I decided to talk about these issues today. Because it's important that we call on our elected representatives in our community to do what we can for Sudan and the people of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Okay. This is another picture of the Democratic, of, I believe this is a picture taken in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I brought these pictures up here to this presentation to remind us all that these are real people experiencing real life things in real time as we speak right now. And it's important to remember that these individuals here, that these are not just people on a photograph. These are real people walking and breathing amongst us today. I know we probably couldn't really comprehend what it would be like to experience a crisis like what is going on in Sudan in the Democratic Democratic Republic of Congo, it is important that we always stay conscious and aware of what is going around in our own local communities to foreign issues like that that is happening in Africa. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about Salem, Massachusetts and numbers. <coughs> All right, so Salem, Massachusetts has a population of about 44,000 individuals. Now, when we were talking about how Salem was built on the displacement and silent genocide of Africans, and how we think about Salem, Massachusetts was built on the genocide and displacement of Native Americans, 72% of this population is white. So as you can imagine, it would probably be easy for non-African Americans, Africans and Native Americans to just put these issues in the back of our minds and not think about it. It's not something that is going to disrupt our day to day. Only 6.1% of Salem residents like myself and a few lovely, beautiful people here in the crowd are black. Now think about how many Africans were transported here in Salem and forced to do slave labor. And think about how many of them in today's world, in today's age, can't afford to live here. 
because of the obstacles that systematic oppression and late stage capitalism have created. It is said that the average rent here in Salem, Massachusetts is $2,700, which is a lot for anyone. But because of the generational wealth that was created off of the slave trade, a lot of people who have lived in homes that have been passed down from the 16th century, this is not a number they have to worry about. This is not a number they have to think about. It is said that 14.9% of Salem residents live in poverty today. Now, when it comes to the greater scheme of things, you probably have a lot of politicians say, that's a low number. But I'm going to tell you why I believe that this is unacceptable. When it comes to 2024 in Salem, Massachusetts, the city council budget is about $200 million a year. And when it comes to tourism and consumerism in town, Salem generates about $800 million a year. So why is it that anyone here in town is living in poverty when we are making millions, nearly a billion dollar in revenue a year? This is something that has to change. I don't believe anyone in Salem deserves to live in poverty and face food and housing insecurity when we are making so much money as a town. Now we're talking a little bit about how 6.1% of Salem population is black and only less than 1% of Salem population is native. And that is really sad considering that this was Nomkeg territory. And now this is what I'm most excited about. I wanna talk a little bit about Palestine and how we need to do a call of action. All right, now this is not an opinion that is represented by the Salem Santana Temple. This is simply an opinion of my own. But in October 2023, Mayor Pongalo, Senator Joan B. Lovely, and the city council called in support of Israel. And since October 7th, 30,000 Palestinians have been murdered due to airstrikes by the IDF and raids by IDF soldiers. And 30,000 is a growing number that grows by the minute, grows by the hour, grows by the day, grows by the week. And the IDF has said that there is no plans on stopping until the Palestinian people are eradicated because they believe that every Palestinian member in Gaza is a Hamas terrorism terrorist. This is not true. The people of Palestine are beautiful and rich in culture. They deserve to live on their indigenous land that is Gaza. I can't believe that we as a country are allowing 30,000 plus people to be murdered and displaced because it is too uncomfortable for us to talk about. But what happens when, um, what would happen if a foreign country came and attacked us? Do we get to ask for help? when we can't even help our neighbors across the ocean. We need to do more. And this is my statement as Coyote, Salem residents since 2022, Satanic Temple members since 2021, I am calling on, on words and action of Mayor Pongal of Salem, Massachusetts. Um, Senator Joan B. Lovely, Senator Elizabeth Warren, and Governor Mara Healy to call for immediate ceasefire for Gaza and deliver aid.
when 10,000 children plus have been murdered. What can you even say to that? 10,000 plus children murdered, thousands of children buried under rubble, can't escape thousands of children that are going without limbs and family members. I believe that Salem is a beautiful town and I believe that together we can come together as a community and help those in need and move forward in 2024 with a little bit more sympathy and empathy post this conversation. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. something that has been my life mission to stand up for those 